trading is about knowing the field. Foreseeing the opportunity. Executing at the right moment. Timing is everything. Hello, everybody, and welcome along to yet another edition of The Good, The Bad and The Rugby in partnership with City Index, the leading provider of spread betting, CFD and FX trading. It's good to be back with you. We are riding the train of positivity this week, are we not? Uh, because if we don't, we might well cry. I'm not sure anybody comes here to listen to our views on Ukraine. I think we'll leave that for others to talk about, but hang on in there to the goodies. Um, I absolutely loved my rugby weekend. It was Saturday delightful. morning to Sunday late afternoon. The sun was out and it was brilliant. No, you, you were on good form at checking out. <laughs> you didn't. No, no, I was about to say no. Fully agree. Fully agree. Sorry, yeah. You just went no. No. Nope. Oh, nope. no I was going. No. Nope, you could start agree. with yes yeah. if we're doing positive. Yes, I fully agree. Well, I was. Gonna, one thing I'd have is I didn't get to fully sit down and watch the French game properly because uh, corporate twickers, <laughs> yeah. corpus, corpus, warpers. Um, let's just quickly recap. We had a full house at Twickenham. You were on great form Thank with you. the people. Tins was there having a great time at the green room. England won a nail biter. It wasn't a great game. I'm sure we'll agree. But Wales left with something, which they probably deserved. We had heartwarming scenes at the end, which we'll come on to. Um, really, really good to see a proper unity between both sets of players, obviously off the back of a Lions tour as well. Uh, and much needed as well, 12 months on from the fairly unseemly death threats and unpleasantness of Cardiff. So it was very nice to see that. France was superb, Scotland down, but they had positives. Rory Darge, welcome to the Test Arena. Chaos in Dublin, but plenty to talk about um, if you're putting positive spins on it. Mia Tyndall was involved in two absolute thrillers for Minch Minis. Harry Payne got stuck in for Richmond under 10s against some very good teams at Rosslyn Park. Life is good and all of it played and out was the Minnie, sunshine. Minnie Haskell said. battering Chloe's bladder. Maybe, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. 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 Running decoy lines <laughs> yeah. in the well, womb. She's got, she's, got the, um, she's got a little app that I have to... I, I, I am obviously the very interested app. in... The fruit yeah, app. Fruit, yeah. Size they are. yeah, it's apparently she's an onion, size of an onion at the moment. And right. she's doing little teaspoons of wee, apparently. Again, right. I'm not sure I needed to know that. Chloe <laughs> made sure I had... I basically I had to turn off all technology, give a full undivided attention to hear about Your how onion. things were developing. But yeah, she's, she's good. Bertie was good. Good. He was very happy to um, come back from the dog sitters. Um, how, did, how did he do this weekend? Bertie. Yeah. Predictions predictions. I think he did all right. No, he, he actually called Wales, unfortunately, but oh, then he? he got... Well, he wasn't far off. No, and he obviously... And I think he called Ireland and he called um, France. Two out of three again. Two out of three, yeah. out of three again, yeah. He's running far hotter than we are. <laughs> do you know, someone at Twickenham, and actually this was a really heartwarming moment, there were lots of heartwarming moments, but someone, we were doing the Players' Lounge with the RFU, um... Somebody came up and said they'd taken up rugby again, having listened to the pod. Really? He said, I missed it so much. I'm still only playing third team, but I absolutely love it. And that, in some ways, is sort of putting a bit of good back. That's it? amazing. I was really, yeah, I was yeah. really, really it's, pleased it, Well, by it's that. good because it's a, it's a big thing at the moment in, in grassroots rugby. Obviously, you know, doing back in the stuff game. for Minch, back in the game. Yeah. Um, you know, if you do listen and you used to play and you, you COVID's meant that you've stopped playing, just go back, do a bit of training. You don't have to play every week. Just... Get back involved. Have a few Remember, pints with your mates. Yeah. Yeah. It's not even all about the rugby all the time. It's a lot of it's about your mental health and yeah. just getting back around the lads and having a few beers and yeah. and, and sharing stories. I imagine there's quite a lot of people who listen to this podcast and now hate it so much they'd rather be anywhere else. <laughs> so it's still having the same driving driving them back. Driving, driving, yeah. Yeah. Forcing them Whatever away. You're welcome. <laughs> Local rugby clubs around the world, you're welcome. You're welcome. Shall we start with Twickenham first of all? It wasn't a cracking game. It was a cracking occasion. It's the first Six Nations game with a full house since, I don't know, for a long old time. Thoughts, uh, thoughts, thoughts overall, yeah, first of all. I, I wouldn't, it wasn't a cracking first half. Yeah. But you cut, again, what do we want at the end of a game into the 85th minute with the game on the line and someone's got to make a, you know, unfortunately someone's either got to make a play, which Maro Otoji did, or someone's going to have to make a mistake. And um, what else do you want? Uh, yes, the first half was, was, Dull, um, but that was mainly because of mistakes. And but it wasn't from a lack of intent to try and play. There were a lot of line breaks. Uh, Cuthbert had the, the game of his life. Never seen make so many line breaks. Yeah. Um, it wasn't because of that. It was just final finishing pass. A lot of penalties in that first half where the referee was just trying to set a, a tone. But then the second half, you can't argue about the second half about drama and and everything you love about sport and the fact that it's coming down to the last play. I'm sat next to Jiffy, friend of the show. 
And he's uh, the first half, he's like, oh my God, we're shit. Oh, shit, this is, we've got no cutting edge. And then at the end of it, he's going, we're going to win. We're going to win it. We're going to win it. Everyone he said that's not playing well is now having the game of their lives. Um, and and that's that's the beauty of sport is the roller coaster. And I think it's, it's far better if you compare it to England against Italy, where the first half you think, okay, we're going to explode. Then the second half still, yeah. at least when you finish with a second half like that, everyone leaves happy because it's a, it's a genuine contest. And I think off the field, you got the same reaction from the fans yeah. that you would have got from the players. They've just done a hard fought match and they, everyone, everyone's walked away happy. It felt like one of those scouts fires, you know, which you're, you're, you're flicking the flint on in the first half. There were so many opportunities for the fire to go off. You know, England had five metre lineouts, five metre scrums. Wales had six or seven minutes of, of possession early on and it didn't quite catch fire and then, it, and, and then eventually it did type thing, didn't it? But England, did England deserve it? Um, I, I think it's hard about teams deserving it. I think, you know, but obviously both gave it incredible effort. We were actually down pitch side in that last kind of seven minutes and obviously everywhere I stood, people were, get out of the way, sit down because <laughs> I make a great door, not a great window. So hey, was, <laughs> behemoth. Yeah, get out of the way, me, hey, that's cool, me. <laughs> Keep it in the zoo, man. You know, you know, like when you go to football stadiums and there's obviously like chanting and everyone dropping the sea bomb. <laughs> the biggest insult to it was sit down, sit down. <laughs> so they were giving out abuse to everybody, but to Alex and myself, and we were sitting by the hoarding. Well, more to you, not, wow. not so much to me. Yeah, I would sort of, we were we were I'm a pencil, together. Yeah, yeah. Door. As long as you're turned sideways, you're not blocking anyone's view. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and he. Um, it basically, we, we, you know, obviously as they got to that last five minutes, we thought they might do it. Yeah. You know, there was that moment where um, Matt, uh, I think Courtney got his hand on the on a ball, nudged yeah. it on, penalty. We thought, wow, is this going to be the moment? And actually, we kind of wanted them to do it. I think we were sitting there going, we're obviously England fans, but it'd be quite cool if Wales got away with it. What a turn up for the books. But I think the fact that the sun was shining, Twickenham was at its best. Everyone was actually in full voice. I'm normally quite critical sometimes about... Um, the England fans, the fact is Twickenham is quite corporate. Um, and, the, you know, they've only got one song, Swing Low, Sweet Chariot, which they tried to, to take away for us for various reasons. But they were, they were belting it out. And I thought it, was, I thought it was incredible. And to see the players afterwards, you know, I had a chat with Liam Williams, obviously disappointed. Half his head was hanging off with, with blood on his face. And, but I think everyone was happy and slightly relieved. But I think England, because of the way they endeavoured to attack and actually created some of those line breaks, I think probably were the better team for part for most of that game. Yeah. Um, but I don't think anybody deserved to win it. I think, well, I think every, both sides deserved to win it, sorry, but I, I, I think it, it kind of ended up as it should have done. I think I think with it, uh, what I would say about England is there's still, there is still place in Test Match Rugby for building a score. The three, six, nine, you know, Wales turned down two shots at goal, three shots at goal, went for the line outs, then came away with nothing. And ultimately, England turned down three when Liam Williams went to the bin as well. I did, I did think um, actually that cause that point when, when you talked about France two weeks ago about them now building a score mm. and just chipping away at it and, and just getting those getting those points. It always seems to me, and this is actually based on no fact at all, but when England start um, a tournament, autumn, Six Nations, or whatever. The first few games, if they had an opportunity to take points, more often than not, they go for the, the line out and then they kind of either narrowly win or have lost, like, for example, against Scotland, where we felt they could have gone for the draw or whatever. But actually, then they seem to, then later on in those games, with the game management, start to make the more appropriate decisions. And actually, I really liked it that Marcus Smith, even though he, I thought he played brilliantly on the weekend, just kept taking the points, mm. kept taking him, kept taking him. And suddenly, as, that, as Mike said, you're in that great position and it's almost like they learn the game management. I know it's, Eddie says it's a young team, but it's those little bits that you just, that's what makes us, you know, the, sort of the precedent should be set straight away that we always try to build a score. Yes, we'd like to see line outs. Unfortunately, the crowd want to see tries, but actually that's what you have to do. And I thought that was the big telling telling thing between the sides. Every time we got into their 22 or more often than not, we took, we came away with the, with the, with the points. And I just as well, to mention to Courtney Laws, who I thought was utterly brilliant. Yeah. Um, what a machine that man is. Ben Young's as well. Breaking so I want record. to go through some of this in a sort of quick fire, no particular order, just some real standout performance for the day. You've touched on, I'm going to come back to, you, to your turn. Alex Cuthbert, first of all. I mean, just, I'm an England fan, but having seen his journey in the sport where, I mean, he took untold abuse playing for Wales for a while. He was a lion in 2013. Then it dipped all to, you know, hugely, went back to Exeter. I mean, I, I, I think it was one of the best games I've ever seen him play. Yeah, Most metres he's ever made, I think. For, in a, for in sure. And, and I'm not, I would honestly say I'm not his biggest fan in terms of, you know, I think that it, it, certain parts about his game. But when he's on as an athlete, is what he is, he can break tackles all day long. And that was, he looked, you know, his 50th game, right? Yeah. 
So uh, you want to do that on your 50th game and I, and you've just got to tip your cap to him and say, fair play, his work rate, he was everywhere. He was on his wing, the other wing. Um, and he deserves all the plaudits off the back of it because he does get a hard time a lot of the time. And when and when someone plays as well as that, they need to people need to make sure they t- they tell him. That is weird that that he gets such hard because you know I, you can you can understand why I would get a hard time, but he just doesn't. I doesn't he doesn't even strike me as that kind of. He seems like a really nice guy. He's not outwardly kind of show offy. He's not kind of difficult. But it's just because of the perception of him as a winger, he just gets hammered more often than not by Welsh fans. And I think exactly right. We love the underdog kind of story and actually much more the emotional story rather than the nuances of the game on this on this show and for someone like him to come and do that I thought was was brilliant but just just to get in the mix and get that and do it like he did because yeah. after the first couple of breaks you know you could hear people go wow well, yeah, Cuthbert's doing well yeah. and then it just became consistent throughout the game it was part of that a sort of nothing to lose mentality I know you could, you probably never take to the field with a nothing to lose mentality but given what he's been through if anyone can get into that place it's probably yes. did, you ever, did yes. you ever play with a I've got nothing yes. to lose here yes. mentality uh, and, and what was the impact of that well I played some of the best rugby in my life um, can because, you think of incidents like yeah, well, specific I, 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 yeah I mean, I mean Australia in 2000 I mean under Eddie Jones all of that was I, I had this moment where I had I talked about it in Watt Flanker I was sitting in a cafe in um, Chiswick with a friend of mine um, Mark Trav of course you were of course I was darling um, <laughs> sipping on a flat white and um, we're having a chat and, and he put the video game up of me playing at Swickenham. And he said, I want to go through the video with you. He's a guy called Travis Allen. He's a Kiwi. Obviously, Kiwis know more about us immediate of rugby than anybody else immediately. And he was really influential in helping me make some, some you know, really game-changing decisions. He went through the game. He looked at it. He was like, look, you're just avoiding the ball. You know, you're, you're like, you don't, you don't look like you want to carry. You look like you're playing within yourself. You're like nervous about making mistakes. And I didn't like what he said. And I was like, you know what? I was like, who the fuck do you think you're talking to? Like, you know, you, you don't even play. You haven't even played international rugby. And then I went away and I went, do you know what? Actually, he's exactly right. I'm playing in myself. I was more worried about making mistakes than I was uh, performing. And I was kind of being a bit, um, I didn't want to get criticized. I was just being very comfortable. And I then decided that I wanted to play every single game as if A, it was my last, but I or wanted to create a highlight reel. So if I wanted to try something, I did. So, you know, there's time I play for England, throwing the ball between my legs against New Zealand, you know, trying to offload. You know, I, and I, I had it in my game in part, but I probably got away with it and become way too conservative. And then from, when Reddy Jones came in, I knew I was lucky to be still involved with England. I didn't think I was going to be involved again. And that's how I took the field. And that's how I played the rest of my career. And I, when I talked about regrets, when we did that retirement show years ago, was uh, I wish I'd realised that more often and not played with inside myself. And it looked like he just played for himself. Mm. And actually, people say about playing for the team, but if you have a point of difference and his ability to get over the game line is his point of difference, you need to do that. Yeah. Whereas a lot of players, especially young players, they try to be all, they try to work on every area of their game. And actually, you don't want to do that. There's no point telling Billy Vinopola to do things he can't do. Or, you know, there's, there's very few players that are completely rounded. You know, if you've got something exceptional skill, like he has the ability to get that line break for such a big unit, he's fast. Why not go and play it? And I think 100% it can have that positive effect on you. And 100% it can change the way that you um, you perform. And I, I think it's a great lesson because actually it, it follows into life outside of the sport. If you're worried about what people are thinking and doing and whether criticise you're going to get, the criticism you're going to get, you end up being inhibited. Yeah. I'd say to anybody, just go and do what you need to do and worry about yourself. And if your teammates and your coaches are okay with it, the rest of it doesn't matter. And that was a massive salutary lesson that I, that I learned. And he seems to have done that really well. Well done, Alex Cuthbert. Onwards and upwards. Right, let's do quick fire, quick fire positives. Um, can we just talk about Ellis's wheels on the wide outside? I've yeah. never seen him roller skate so fast. He uh, didn't quite get there, but what a turn right. of speed! He he's pl- he played really well on yeah. the weekend. Um, you need you know when you just want him to be his best, carrying best, and he was that on the weekend. And he has got pace. I mean, I think uh, he almost he almost caught someone from behind as well. I mean. He's he's playing so well, and it's yeah. great to see. And just speaking to people in the in the green room on the weekend, and people are, from Bristol are so excited for him to go back. And everyone's now seeing what we've been talking about for two years: the change in his mentality and and everything. And he's starting to see that more and more consistently on the field. Did you see his post? Yes, it was, it was very yeah. good. That very yeah. good. And, and it also with, been, his, with his little one yeah. saying, yeah. "My boy," with his with um, best, English, English yeah, best, best baller, baller. Yeah. yeah, and, and Marcus, Marcus Smith. Smith. Yeah, <laughs> it was genius. Again, that was one of those. I don't want those wistful moments, obviously, with the impending birth at some point. My daughter, fingers crossed. I realized, I looked at Slady as well with yeah. his cute um, little girl and obviously Jack Knoll. 
I'm I'm never going to have had that. And uh, you know, and you talk about wanting to have it earlier, and it wasn't the right time for me to do it earlier. But actually, those moments where you think, "How cool is that?" The photo of you know Ellis with his son looking at Marcus Smith. Just those moments are you can't buy them. And you know, the, the kid doesn't know now, but at some point they're going to look back and reflect. Go, that was a special special moment. Yeah, I mean, I I, uh, I so we had Mia in 2014. I retired in 2014, so I've got a few pictures of me walking around carrying her on the pitch in the last game and stuff, and that's it. But it's still not it's still not the same as she'll most of them grow up Mia uh, has an idea but the others the other two won't have a clue really what I did or what unless you choose to go down memory lane with them there's one thing I I said to Chloe and I came out of the house and I said um I was to say about I wanted to keep something and I said I'll show it to her and she, and you know she goes it was something about me DJing she went she's not going to know about that she's going to know about you being a rugby player I went but I don't think she will and I don't have that moment and I wonder if it gets me a little bit wistfully sometimes when you see the lads going I don't want the I don't want I don't need my kid to appreciate what I did, but actually sharing that moment would have been quite special, I think, for both yeah, of us. Yeah, I, I, I agree. But at the same time, Mia keeps going around saying he's the best rugby player ever. So <laughs> I'm quite happy she's, she's never seen a game. Yeah, okay. I'm then. quite happy she's never seen a game. <laughs> Otherwise, she'd go, actually, she's not. Um, so, yeah, look, I uh, yeah, I, agree. I completely agree. I would have loved to. You know, Bol, Bol Shu, my best mucker, he obviously had his kit. Well, not obviously, if anyone didn't know. He had his kids quite quite young and they're, they're late into their teens and they would all remember him playing which I always think would be really nice one of them is a really good tennis player isn't yeah it? Felix it's Felix yeah. yeah I've got might have a bet on him to win a major at some point he's that good well he yeah he's he's been in the top uh, 10 of his age group in France so he's good. Yeah. Insane. I do. I do. I do think though. Where's me goom shield? I'd love. Yeah. <laughs> I'd love him to come running on. Where's me tennis racket? <laughs> I, do, <laughs> I don't know where the bolster wants to tell this, but I did ring him once, and he was obviously watching Felix. Uh, he was watching Felix train, and he went, "Hang on, Felix, that's." <laughs> he did swear. That's rubbish. If you're going to do it like that, I'm not bringing you anymore. <laughs> Hello, mate. You're all right. I said inspirational parenting. That bolster. That's how you get he, And he goes, "It's like, hey, he's like me, mate." If I if don't tell him, he'll just do it all the time. <laughs> I love that. But I, what what's, I think now with those, this generation is everything lasts forever. So you know when tra- someone tries to reassure you, mainly yeah. a friend of mine going, oh, by the way, James, don't worry about today's newspapers, tomorrow's chip paper. It's absolutely not. So <laughs> so when, you know, with me at one point when she does take more of an interest, because they do, they get that she's moment. Not, she's not allowed an iPad or a Google search. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> God, I mean, but at yeah. some point she's going to go Google, some they're going to YouTube, they're going to be like, 10 and then they'll get into it you see it with um, uh, some of the other players kids who were completely disinterested and then they've discovered what their dad did but I'm just terrified about how much stuff I can get off taken off the internet well, I was going to say that surely there's a detective out there who can clear up your past history you can pay a lot to get it all for forensically removed is that right yeah, yes yeah. apparently but I, I just fucking I'll be, like, I'll be like listen I'm so sorry we haven't got a name for it <laughs> baby potato I'm so sorry talking of kids on pitch some really nice uh, pictures with Ben Youngs with his son and daughter at the end as well and I would like you to pay due tribute to because you haven't always been his biggest fan but actually not only is it a hell of an achievement but also he played a hell of a role in steadying a, a ship that yeah. sprung a couple of leaks at that point 60 minutes and uh, look as I, I'll always say you don't get 115 caps for not being a quality player now what goes in between that is are other players playing well at time that's personal preference whatever but he plays better off the bench. He was so good. And the ball went away. Whether he just goes on, he knows he's got to play fast te- uh, pace tempo because he's only on for 30 minutes. But he was so good. The ball was away quicker than I've ever seen it before. He runs that little bit, which then holds those first two defenders as Haskell And then if your forwards are running around the corner, it gives the likes of Ellis, Marrow, uh, Don Brandt, those those chances to to really get on the front foot and hit the back foot. And um, yeah, no, congratulations to him. I mean, I mean to beat the the greatest in Leonard, then um, congratulations to you. Yeah. It's, it's a hell of an achievement. Uh, uh, He'll put, it's put incredi- it's an incredible opinion. Uh, for, for someone in England. I that's I mean we've discussed this before. He's only the Second, Second yeah. centurion yeah. in England, whereas Australia have got about thirty all but, blacks. Same. But, all blacks. but to yeah. say, but I know that you spoke about this before uh, on last week's pod about the central contracted system. Once you're in a centrally contracted system, playing for your country in a small country like, in terms of population like you know, Australia or Wales or whatever, once you're in, it's very hard to get out. Whereas in England, with the, the amount of games that we play, the injuries that then happen off the back of it to stay fit for that amount of time, even though there's more games now than when Leonard played, 
to stay fit all that time and in a, and in favor and in favor is very very rare. Um, and you know, so you know, you look at you, you would expect Owen to get to a hundred, but if everyone keeps coming up, it you know he's in an injury at the wrong time and you're out for a long time, and then the team does has a successful period. Do you get straight back in? It's uh, it's not easy, not easy at all. You know, yeah. you know, Wilco should have cruised there, but injuries paid to to that. It's weird because we're the only sort of species on the planet that puts a stall by by numbers. We don't, you know, we don't normally kind of nothing, nothing else does that. But actually, it's such an amazing thing to, to to do, even though it doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things. To do it like he's done it, and to get to that level of caps, and to beat Jason over here, I think is amazing. And also to remain of just the same kind of bloke the whole way through. I think um, is is pretty special. And most you know, most people haven't got a bad word to say about about Ben. Um, and to do it in a way he does it, he's such a nice, friendly face. And I was there when he made his debut, two thousand and ten, and he's he's been great all the way through. So I'm, I couldn't be more excited. Does the, does the Twitter thing still exist about things that Ben says? Oh yes. Uh, that, I well, mean, didn't Tom Croft start? Crofty that? started it. I mean, but he does. He did generally always just drop those clangers <laughs> all the time. <laughs> There's a very cool mural that they've done on the wall at Holt Rugby where it all began. I don't know if you saw that. They've got no. a graffiti artist. It looks really good. It's worth having a little look at. Uh, from 115 to 50, well done the Stinkler. God, his back looked big, didn't it? Massive back. <laughs> Massive back. The, but I think it's an exponential growth versus the number of caps he's got with the more incoherent bollocks he's posting on social <laughs> media. It's, it's just utter, utter nonsense. But I love I love it. It's the best way of right, putting a picture of yourself up and just putting a load of sidetracking bullshit about <laughs> spirit, destination, earth, life goals. And it just stinks. Just... Post a picture and go, oh, look, sexy as fuck. Crack on. <laughs> look but, at the size of my back. Yeah, I thought he was great, you know, in the in the way he carried. Um, and he's such a character as well. I think he's got his new documentary coming out on ITV3, apparently. He, uh, ITV4, ITV4, Against the Odds, telling inspirational stories from across the world of sports on, um, well, you probably get it by the ITV player. I'll tell you what was against the odds, that the um, the council didn't shut down the playing permission for him putting that shower in the cupboard. <laughs> and all, <laughs> do you think they'll make against he the odds? odds? He can do whatever he wants, he'll still be the guy who put a shower in yeah. a cupboard. If you put a shower yeah. in a cupboard with absolutely no draining or sealant, then put your urinal <laughs> in his living room because he used to piss out the French windows. <laughs> but, <laughs> but James again, Haskell ruining reputation. Yeah, exactly. by no. Way. no, but he, again, he deserves it. Because, um, you know, both he's come on a real long journey in terms of his own... I, I think he was always actually much more of a caricature than than um, the, the media would have you believe. I, I think he's much more sensible, but I think he like played up to it. But he's a fantastic player um, and a really good guy, and such you know he's a real sweetheart as well, which makes a difference. You know, Don Brandt, hell of a finish. That's <laughs> that's a, it's sort of rugby's equivalent of the slam dunk, where you get it by millimeters at full full extension. Yeah, I, I, I get, but it was great. I thought he had a, a great game. Yeah. Yeah, like I thought for the first time, you know, it's been tough because we've all been calling for Domron and Simmons. By the way, I thought Simmons played really well when he came off the bench. Big defence. Um, yeah, he, sm he smashed... Uh, Falata, I think it was. Falata, like twice. Yeah. Um, uh, but it's just great to see them. Maybe it's just a time thing. and a, you know, People talk about combinations and the fact that in modern day rugby, you don't really spend time on combinations because the team changes so much. And it just shows that... Yeah, when you, when you get that feeling of being in the team and understanding your role within it, you will get better within that. Uh, and I thought finally he, you know, he's, he carried the ball hard. Obviously, he took his try at full at full uh, dive, like you said, uh, off the back uh, of the line out. And I just thought it, it, again, it was a good, it was the best game he's had for England so far. And hopefully, that gives him the confidence to move forward and the confidence in Eddie to either stick with him or yeah. and, and put a bit more faith in the him. The balance, I'd say, the balance mm. of the the forward pack in particular looked better. Because I, I, I thought Charlie Yules yeah. had his best game for England. Yeah, I thought Charlie Yules was very good. Marrow did what Marrow does. I thought Tom Curry, you know, obviously there's a lot of hype around about Tom, but it's so justified in my mind. You know, there was a great moment where, um, I think, was it Malin's chased, uh, chased down Liam Williams, you know, right next to him's Tom Curry on the kick chase, you know, and, and I think got the turnover at mm. the breakdown in, in, on the bottom right-hand corner. I thought he was very good. I thought Courtney Laws adds a completely another dimension. One of the issues we, we had as an England team when, you know, and I still rate, rate Billy and Mac, I think they're brilliant, but when you had those guys in the team, Billy was a carrier, Macko was a carrier, and then you didn't have many other guys who wanted to get their hands on the ball. Now when you play, defence has got to worry about Don Brandt, it's got to worry about Curry, it's got to worry about Courtney, yeah. it's got to worry about Ellis, it's got to worry about Sinks, and it's got to worry about uh, Luke Cowan Dickey and also Jamie George. And suddenly you're having to make much more decisions where actually it was a little bit predictable. If you had Billy, 
and someone else you're like, Billy's definitely going to carry. And that's why at times when we played the better sides, say like New Zealand, he hasn't had the day that he would want. And I think now with the guys putting those amount, is it, um, Don Brandt's 16 carries or, or 61 metres or something yeah. like that he got. Uh, I think Courtney, you know, we've talked about how his development, his footwork at the line, but his physicality in the defence... When you know he's going to hit someone, you got no Cor- Curry's going to hit someone. Charlie Yules, I think, you know, he, he's added that real physical element. I think Maro, with his ability to compete on the ball, you're suddenly making so many, um, asking so many questions of of of, of an attack. So I, I think the balance is really good, and I think, like you said, if you want to filter in, like a Simmons could easily start against the side if you wanted to be slightly more dynamic, or you bring him off the bench and add that kind of real value when some, when you're tired. Imagine, you know, you, you you change the front row, you bring on some other back row, and someone like Sam Simmons comes comes on, you're like, oh, for fuck's sake. Yeah. Um, a quick word on Wales. I mean, they just will not go away, and you've got to give them enormous credit for that. But, I mean, Falatau, enormous. Thomas Williams, lively. What, what, what did you like? Where, yeah. did you, where would you no, go? No, I, I liked, I thought a lot of people, Nick Tompkins, I thought, yeah. st- stepped up in that second half. I, You know, whether... They need to play that a little bit looser to get that to get that game because what we can't figure out, what I can't figure out about Wales is how they are trying to play. I know that Wayne Pivac generally wants to play a movement game, wants to play an offloading game, and they're going through a transition of losing their 700 caps or whatever that aren't available for selection at the moment. But I think it's going to be a good thing because they have to start relying on other people. You know that. Liam Williams has to become a leader. If you, you know, if Tompkins is going to be in there all the time, they need to sort of step up. Obviously, bigger last week was a not last week was it last week two weeks ago was the leading light in terms of wouldn't go off, didn't want to go off to. Yeah. Keep. They need they need those um, they need those players to start influencing that group because there is going to be a younger group that comes through. You can't rely on you know your Jonathan Davies, you know your Alan Wynn coming back, your Tipperick, you know, all these people who are out at the moment. You can't rely on them to come back. You still have to have these these players have got to lead you forward. And they, they've got to be able to play like that. I mean, they outscored three tries to one, which again goes back to the point of England taking those points was vital. Yeah. Um, but and as we we talked about, has we like I like that team on paper. Now a few of the Welsh people I was speaking on the weekend didn't like it, but I was still saying you know there's great individual talent. They've just yeah. got to pull it all together. And then the second half, you saw all that individual talent, line breaks, you know, clean breaks. They they made more clean breaks than we did. Um, so there is creativity there. They've just got to get that consistent. But what last year proved is they get better after with each game. I don't know why that is. Um, that you know they seem to be a slow start and, start and gradually get better. Um, that's something they've got to figure out. But the, I think they still have players as well. The experience of going to Twickenham, right, going behind like they did, and then showing that resilience to get back into the game to almost seal it out to raise that physicality. When you look at guys like Tame Basham, who hasn't had that experience before, suddenly that's just another experience in in the bank and will help with that with that transition. Now, you might not get the result you want now, but those lessons on how to execute, to look after the ball in the final moment, because they, they could have 100% won that game. Yeah. You know, if was it finished four points behind, you know, if they'd made some better decisions, um, like you said, taking the points earlier, they they could have well and, well and truly done that. I thought England showed their resilience with their defence. But actually, Wales... I don't think they are that far off. And I think when you look at the sides, you know, Falatau's had two games back. He was brilliant. Jonathan Davis with the biggest sexist quads I've ever seen. You and calves I, weren't small either. Yeah, you and I were blown away by yeah. it. But he's, now he's running on with that, without his scrum cap on. So everybody knows what he looks like. He's an absolute <laughs> dreamboat. But he, you know, he's obviously now got 100 caps in there and he, I don't think he's going anywhere anytime soon. Yeah. So they're not, I don't think they are in a bad place. I think... They're not far off from getting that getting that result um, and, and executing. And as I said, I think they've got better each each game. Wonder if it'll come in two weeks' time against Le Bleu. Yeah. Well, we shall, we see. shall see. I mean, that was so. Jiffy was saying that they need to be fast starters. They had the worst start, first restart, yeah. lose the ball, didn't yeah. touch the ball for five minutes or whatever, and England. And then they had a period points. of pressure and yeah. didn't get anything. And didn't from get it. anything from it and kept yeah. going for the corner. So you know, if you look at all the stats, they they it was pretty match for match. The only difference was England took six penalties. Yeah. I just want to finish with probably the most heartwarming bit of the weekend, which was that we went pitch side afterwards because you get to interview a few of the England players for the corporate box that we're in. And it was just really, really not... I've never really asked you about the sort of half an hour after a game before, but it was really interesting watching you pitch side. And Fox Davis came over, Marrow, Elliot and Jamie, Will Rowlands came in and said hello, Neil Jenkins came in and hugged with you, Hugh Bennett, chatted to us. I'm not sure either of us understood a word that he said. <laughs> Hugh Bennett, but honestly, he was very spoke, friendly. To, but, spoke to me and Alex and I honestly, 
don't know what he said. Not even, not even close. <laughs> you know, like you pick up a bit of it. He actually said he was thinking he was speaking Welsh. Yeah, but I don't think he was. It was no, just very so friendly. Welsh. Very, very, very friendly. nice yeah. to see Hugh. Mm-hmm. But it was really interesting for me to sort of. It's quite a privileged position to see. Obviously, you were back in in the sort of, I suppose, the the, the hot zone of it, but. It was just really nice to see all the players, lots of Sarri's boys greeting each other. And actually, a lot of that happens away from the cameras. And I just thought it was a really sort of reaffirming point about what rugby so often is. It had been an amazingly tense game, played out in front of 10 million people. And yet, 10, 15 minutes after the final whistle, it's like we're all... It was a really sort of like rugby family moment, which you don't often see at the sharpest end of the game. No, and I think you're probably surprised that anyone spoke to me as well. Well, you made the point, actually, for, for a guy who's pretty divisive, Everyone came up, big smiles, yeah. big hugs. So yeah, you can't have been that big a prick. No, that's what I mean. That's that's what I, <laughs> that's what I've always tried to say is that you know. And actually, what I think what a lot of people do is is they feed back. So the Welsh guys obviously fell fed, fed back the word gets around because from the Lions talk, because my fans go, oh, we used to think you're a dickhead, but you know, so and so says you're all right. Yeah. And so it was actually just very nice to see them. And I, and I think what's happening now is even though the game is is so super professional and you're always focused on on to the next job. What happened back in the day was that you would all mingle and intermingle. Now, you might not go into the change room necessarily and have a, have a beer, like we did when I played in New Zealand, but you do interact. And and for me, um, obviously, I play with a lot of those guys. Um, and it was just very nice to be able to say hello to them and for them to say hello to each other because I think the important thing is you've, you've gone to battle for, for 80 minutes, but actually you've left everything out in the field you don't have there's no yeah. point being grumpy and arsy after the game and being all moody because that's not going to change the change the game um and for yeah it's very special and very privileged for us to be allowed to be to be down there but i think the whole day was very positive and you could see you know when we spoke to Liam Williams I said yeah. you know he's very disappointed and you know Dan Bigger was there Will Rowlands you know obviously his head was hanging off yeah. <laughs> he got a bit of um friendly fire and someone need him in his own <laughs> in in his head but they were all in a a positive, positive way. And I think that's the most important part about rugby and something I always tried to do when I played was go up and say to the opposition and meet these, meet these people that you spend all your time fighting against because what's the point? It's meant to be a social, a social occasion. You do your job, yeah. then, you, then you, have, you have a chat. So I think it, it was very nice. And the fact that the England players were encouraged to go around the field and actually say, say hello and the Welsh wanted to come out and see their, their, their family. I mean, I even saw Bobby Boucher, the rope. You went and saw the rope. I saw the rope. Uh, congratulations, Bobby. Fifth child, a boy, <laughs> finally four girls and a boy. So um, I think he might tie it in a knot, a big old knot it would be tied in two. But... Bosun. Yeah. Bosun, yeah. Used use it to keep the QE2 anchored in. Um, but no, he, yeah, congratulations, Bobby. He was on good, uh, he was on good form. Yeah, it was a good day. It wasn't the greatest game, but it was a good day. And often, you know, rugby can do that. Um, well done to all involved. And as we said, much, much, uh, better scenes I think than 12 months ago um, and that really in itself is is a good thing we are going to drop in our quick weekly postcard at this point from Honda uh, the official performance partner of England Rugby who are bringing the power of dreams to the game we love they are playing a big role Honda with the volunteers in the English game and also developing their understanding of how England fans feel about the sport they love the supporters relationship with the team their achievements their hopes and those who dream the impossible dreams Honda believes in a challenging spirit embracing failure and the joy of trying things, just like England Rugby and the supporters. Honda, as I'm sure you know, believes in the power of dreams. And you can find out more at honda.co.uk forward slash engine room forward slash Honda XRFU. Uh, have a look at that if you'd like to know more. Um, actually, we'll touch on their volunteer awards a bit later in the year as well. They're doing great things with supporting the people who prop up and keep the grassroots moving. Um, shall we do France next? It's hard not to love a, a lot of what's happening in the blue shirt at the moment. It's impossible not to love it. The brand that they play, even if you go back to the Italy game, obviously didn't really fire, but they still got the win against Scotland. Yeah, you know, some of the tries are just exceptional to watch, and there's just class all the way through. I don't see a chink in their armor at the moment. I just, I, I can't see it. They have a forward pack to die for that are now physical, well organized. Dis- well, so far disciplined. Yeah. <laughs> they're still, a, they're still a. Th- this is the full challenge because they should win a Grand Slam, I think. Well, possibly at a canter. I've- yeah, possibly. You know, England have got to get better. I mean, obviously, that England's only focus can be Ireland because that's going to be tough for England because Ireland are good as well. Um, but uh, you know, you just you go through. I mean, could you ever name a French full fifteen and? 
and I could probably name the twenty one or uh, twenty three at the moment. Yeah. yeah, that's how. That's just the quality they have throughout it. Um, their back three, unbelievably solid. I was thinking that they're, they're so good at the moment. Bryce Dula, who was their player of the tournament yeah. last year, I mean, and was my man crush, has been replaced crush. by my new one, yeah. <laughs> Jaminet. So Jaminet. Yeah, Jaminet. I would say why why one bit of disappointment was that Fiku try when he <laughs> just ran. Across the field, it's quite under tens rugby. That, that yeah. was I saw yeah. a lot of that at Rich at Russell Park. <laughs> That's on what Sunday I mean. I, I looked at it and I was like, "Wow!" So it's out the back door pass. So he's just in line with the post, and he just ran around the outside, b- bumped someone, and just scored I'm in the corner. Me, I was like, I'd "That pre- shouldn't happen." That should not, <laughs> not you know, because that's the kind of try that when Seller was playing, or when you watch the old, you know, <laughs> Wales of old, or the Barbarians, everyone goes, "The greatest generation." You see these old men, like you know, optionally falling over. Like obviously, the very sad passing of Inga Twigamala. Watching him play back in the day. Is like now a current winger where there's like he's r- absolutely ripped up, straight trucking, footwork, and bouncing people. But then you saw the people trying to tackle him. There's one guy like put an arm out, put his head down, and just <laughs> fell on the floor. And, was, and you could see him walk away again. I tried. I was like, you didn't really, mate. It was a bit like that in Scotland's defence. We we're like, what lads? What are you doing? Yeah. yeah. Um, what else do we love? Antoine Dupont. I mean, well, we're, we're just throwing right, superlatives. Yeah. If, the you, if you go, if you go through it, by is carrying exceptionally well. Marchand is 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 fantastic. Machine. Yeah, and literally a machine. You then go to Aldrich, who is just on fire. Then you've got the best player in the world by a country mile who just dictates the show, lifts the tempo, create and if people run into him, he ends them as well. Yeah. It's just like <laughs> Yeah, he's nothing he can't do. You've got the best looking ten in the world just pulling the strings. Yeah. You've got two beasts in the in the centres who can play numerous ways with Fiku, as you say, running around people, but then you've got whether Dante. you use Dante or you know, even Fiku can just crash it up if he needs to be. And then you've got a back three to die for. Right? From all different ways. You've got Pano who's just so crazy, uh, could do anything, and then his gas as well, mm. even when he was chasing back, he chased back on Van der Merwe twice yes. and caught him from behind. Like with comfortable ease, and Van der Merwe's not slow. Yeah. Uh, even when Van der Merwe scored, he he had to step away from the post, and then typical French, he just carried on running, and he ran back around the post. Um, but and then you've got Jamane who can not obviously it was windy on the weekend, but normally is is on fire from the boot. It was in open field kicking was outstanding. That's the thing. I don't don't see where that weakness is it, it, unless it becomes mentally for some reason. Did you see um, there was a, on the French Rugby Union Instagram page they posted a picture of an open training session in the week. Dupont. Cross uh, got a kick, cross uh, crossed uh, across the field a little bit, ran, stepped in, boom, and scored in the corner. Absolute gas. And then against Scotland, you know, training mimicking or, or, or game mimicking training, whatever you want to say, kicked the ball and he boom, made that outside break, yes. stepped, boom, fended and, and offloaded. And it was so interesting to see him do it exactly as he did in training, carving up. And sometimes people carve up in training, but him to do it again in the actual game, I just love that. Do you think in the post match after you've, I mean, because everybody knows that Murrayfield is a it's a, it's a it's a pothole ready to fall into, and the fact that France went there and properly came away, l- 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 sort of um, laps in front. I just wonder whether off the back of that, Dupont gets the yellow dressing gown out and struts around. <laughs> just, when, you know, when you go into the opposition changing changing room, whether he goes in in his canary outfit or whether he's <laughs> it's not quite the same. So good, the, even it's if not quite the same in the Murrayfield uh, changing rooms. They haven't quite updated no. though. Thirty-five years. If he was at uh, Stade de France with that massive whirlpool yeah. and everything else, he's definitely walking straight well, into that. He's actually got uh, as he walks in, he's got a, a harem of people who just take it off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got his birds, 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 birds fluttering, and then, and then, and then somebody goes in and bathes him. He's got a guy like, in uh, a head mic. Milk. He's got a guy in a, he- a head mic. Going, oh my god, two pounds coming in. Excuse me, sir, can you move out of the light? Dress him up. He, asked, he he wants a protein latte. You're not throwing people's faces. But you, you've got to be so good to be able to get away with the yellow dressing. I just love to know the world's reaction if you'd strutted around. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I strutted around on a rooftop in a pink dressing gown, remember? Yeah, yeah. Not quite the same. But I, the you need one... that deleted from your, uh, from your online history. No, I think history. I look very sexy. Oh, okay. um, <laughs> there is one, uh, one element that we've talked about that actually came to fruition and perhaps didn't go according to plan. We've, we've talked about how sexy the, the French coaches were in their chic, tailored, what looks like Armani suits. Yeah. And we we always un- ask where Sean Edwards has been because yeah. he wasn't allowed or didn't appear to be allowed he's in the main coach. He's answered you. He hasn't he answered in. me, but he was allowed into the coach's box. Everyone's dressed in shit. He's in a tracksuit bottoms and a shell suit. And <laughs> I, I just looked completely like, and he's up there celebrating. You know, very famously, yeah. um, 
when he's coaching for Wales and they scored a try and he gave the finger to people, you know, and they always laughed off because she didn't want to get filled in by Sean. It was the very, very much the case of that. All the French, and he's up there like that in a shell suit. I think it was probably suit trousers, trainers, and a flat cap, <laughs> where all the rest of them were just like this, you know, just perfectly like, ah, oh, très bien, bien sûr. Yeah. You can take the boy out of Wigan. No. <laughs> um, quick word on Scotland. It's sort of, I don't really know what, I mean, we're, we're, we're keeping positive. So let's do Rory Darge, first of all, because that's a hell of a, step up to the plate yeah I mean you have to put this in context they were quite they have been decimated by injuries the whole back row had to change yeah um, yeah. it doesn't make it easier to do that in a, in a for a country that we know once you get outside their immediate 23 that you know there's a lack of experience there so you've got you've got to give him a huge huge credit first and foremost and you know like the way you know Ali Price's little step and hold that defence what I was talking about in and how he drops it in. You've got to give, there were positives. Some of the, the couple of the tries they scored were yeah. standing, which we know Scotland can do, but it's just still, you know, ask the, it's not the end of the world for them. They played yeah. probably, well, they played the number one team in the world and on a day when they were on fire. Yeah. I mean, the off, some of the offloading was just outrageous. Someone's going into touch, Jouet, Jouet, Jouet. Yeah, it's Harlem Globetrotter stuff. And yeah, I, I, I don't think you you focus on on Scotland and what they could have done better. I think they scored some uh, some great tries, as I said, but France were was so good that I, day. I wonder after the first game against England, where they won and everyone was hyping them up. This is Scotland's moment, and then obviously they lost against Wales. When you're in the change room, and I can't talk about what it must have been like in Scotland, but I, but I wonder if they were believing the hype and they were talking about it, or I think much more realistic that they probably didn't have the same conversations the media and all the fans yeah. were, building them up, going, this is their Six Nations, they're going to win. And I wonder whether they are as feeling as disappointed as they as everyone is out externally. Do, do you know what I'm yeah, trying to say? Yeah, exactly what you mean. Because I, I wonder, because when, you know, when you get interviewed by the media and they go, so you're on for a Grand Slam game or you're, or you're you know, X and Y is going to happen. And we turn around and say, actually, no, we haven't talked about that once. We've talked about doing our job properly. I would have thought with Gregor Townsend and the Scotland, they would have beaten England, celebrated that moment, come in and go, look, we had a good week. We've got to make sure we, we back it up against Wales. Then they lose. And then everyone talks about, you know, the the kind of failure. And then there was an opportunity for them to potentially beat France or become France's banana skin and they didn't do it. Are they feeling as equally disappointed or are they being much more realistic, do you think, in camp going, look, do you know what? We've got some good players now. We are, we can actually play well. We've beaten beaten an England side, but we need to be more grounded. Or do you think, I'm more just more hypotheticals, do you think they're like, everyone else is going, oh, fucked it again? Well, I, I think it's, I mean, Eddie Jones said it when we spoke to him, Tins, at Penny Hill. And he just said, you know, these games are such fine margins now. England beat South Africa by three in November and everyone goes bananas. England lose by three in Murrayfield and everyone's like, oh my God, England are falling apart of yeah. the team. Suddenly Scotland are the, are the great team yeah. and yet they lose by three in Cardiff the week later. So yeah. I think, and we've, we've spoken about it a number of times, the top eight in the world now, anybody can take a chunk out of anybody on any day. I think it's harder to find a run of form unless you are playing as well as the France team is in this moment. I mean, the rest yeah. I think will all knock each other over. So I was just looking. They I, I just was because uh, I, I wanted to put some context. On, I was just having a look, quick look at the, the stats and everything. You know, if you look at it, meters made, Scotland made six hundred, France made four fifty. So there is there is bits around there, but you'd say, look, kicks from hand. Scotland only did eleven. France to 26. So are you saying they didn't manage their end well enough? Well, Eddie Jones says like that the side that kicks more, the, ball. the yeah. most will, will win the game. He's, you know, he's said it twice now. They've got this algorithm or whatever that, that they can predict to a 96% margin who's going to win. And he said that when he was coaching Japan, they kicked more than anybody else. But because they played in the right areas and played with attacking flair, everyone thought they were brilliant. Obviously, England get labelled as kicking too much yeah. but actually the side more often than not that kicks the most at this level at the moment will will win um, bizarrely I mean I don't know there's probably exceptions to the rule but I just I think it is interesting that the, the fact that Scotland are as we said at the very first show got talent across the board they're not far off yeah and I think um, I just wondered it was more I wonder if they're really disappointed because everybody's lost the red outside you know yeah yeah. And this, is, and this goes back exactly what we said before Six Nations start the question was are they the team that can then go on and win a title? They're always going to be that team who can ruin someone else's title. And they are so close now and they're competing on every time. They're scoring the tries that we need. I, I think that not having their usual back three, there were a few changes up front as well. So I think in the pack they had 
what five six changes in yeah. their pack that make that's a massive you know it mm. has could say you know you you sort of that's a huge change to go through your line out detail your mauling your scrummaging throughout the week and then be singing on the weekend and if if your nuts and bolts aren't right against a team that has everything has literally you know we should send <laughs> not to make it political <laughs> we should be sending them to the ukraine they've got the full toolkit they yeah. can get a job done um you know that's the um that is not an easy thing to do, and and yes, they you know six tries to two, but if, let's not. If Hoggy takes the one that, it, well, oh, yeah, you know, suddenly yeah, it's a very he, different game. I actually didn't. I, you know, normally I, I get onto him when he makes a mistake. Yeah, I've done that. No. I'll leave it with him. Yeah, I just let, but let's say, yeah, leave it. just do it on the pod instead. Yeah, yeah. when you know he walks that in. I don't think they still win, but it's it's a different game, and and Scotland are in a good place. I think you know they do have to try and bring in five six more players that can sit around the squad, which they're happy with. Yeah. But let, you know that was an extreme game to go in with that many changes into the best team in the world and and deliver a win. I think it was a massive uphill battle for them. Yeah. And I think it will be a not, it'll be an interesting taste for some of those players to play against a side as quality as France. Like yeah. I know when you've gone onto the field and you think you've got stuff sorted and then you go against an opposition, you're like, wow. This is where we get to. This is what we get to. And what is it? And what is it when we do the analysis this week? What is it they did so well? Physicality over the game line, speed of speed of ball, attacking options, kicking out of hand, um, you know, looking after the ball, whatever it, what it is that, that France do so well is to see if we can mirror it. I remember we got we were getting pumped all the time and then we looked at... Um, Breakdown speed. You know, we were playing, say, the All Blacks getting three seconds or under for bre breakdown speed, and we were and we were taking four or five seconds. It meant that people were able to get back into position. So we spent such a long time with Eddie, A, or the way we ball carried, B, how quickly we were, we were to clear up, how close the men was for our body height, and it changed the point where we, where we started to play a much more attacking game, a much more speedy game. And actually, I think it is quite a good leveller to get a little taste of that and to see where the benchmark is. Yeah. Um, don't fret Scotland we're coming to cheer you up I'm not sure this is the news you need necessarily <laughs> but you've got it regardless because uh, the good the bad and the rugby have teamed up with Vodafone I'm sure you know this by now in partnership with the British and Irish Lions to support grassroots clubs return to rugby so this Saturday the 5th of March we are off up north to Bannockburn RFC. I just like saying that. Bannock Burn. Bannock Burn. The Battle of Bannock Bannock Burn. It makes you sound Scottish, doesn't it? Yeah, you, you, you can't, you can't Burn. not say it. We're going to be celebrating Bannock Burn's veterans. Are you going to take your boots? <laughs> They're always in the bag. They're always <laughs> in the bag. <laughs> Um, who are going to be playing uh, Hask the Lord and myself are on call to put them through their paces or pacemakers who knows <laughs> uh, it's going to be a full day of rugby we're going to be doing a big old live show in the evening which I understand has been sold out and to top it off your old mate from 2017 Tommy Seymour is coming along as well I'm sure we'll have one or two other special guests uh, on the day we do want to say a big thank you to Canterbury who are going to be providing the kit on the day and Vodafone who are driving this initiative to further the support of grassroots rugby uh, and as I'm sure you know, Vodafone are also developing a resource on their V-Hub for all community clubs across the UK and Ireland, which will help small businesses develop their digital capabilities following the pandemic, which, as we all know, is much needed right now. Keep your eyes peeled in spring 2022 for a great toolkit if you're looking for one for your club. Uh, we're all set for a bumper day and cannot wait to get stuck in. And if you're in the area, we would love to see you at Bannockburn Rugby Football Club this Saturday. Come and get involved. Um, time for an orange card in the game off the back of events in Dublin? Question mark. Well, you know, we we've talked about this before. I I think something needs to be done around around the substitutions. You know, it's a ridiculous ruling. I get why it's there because even though we're a game of gentlemen, somehow we seem to when it comes around to substitutions. Special delivery. Oh, Special delivery. Domino. Domino. Domino, domino, domino. That is a lovely oh, Domino's oh, jacket you've got. Is. Dong, dong. Josh, um, our head of sales, has come in wearing a Domino's jacket. And I have to say, I think it suits you better than the head of sales yeah, role. Really like yeah. 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 You're looking very smart. Yeah. You've actually been better. Air, air, air vented. Air vented. That's got a lot for you. Uh, Christ alive. I mean, but talk about Domino. How many pizzas have you bought this week? Okay. By the way, Josh is still single, uh, ladies who listen to the, yeah, um, the yeah. podcast. But he does yeah. do a mean pizza and delivery. And he will deliver... Okay. Turn around and smile at the camera, camera please. Camera, you've got to smile at the camera. Give him a wave. have to kneel down a bit. Well, actually, yeah, drop down. Crouch down, crouch down. down, crouch down. down. You see, there we are. There, there we are, ladies. Yes, Josh. Slide into his DMs. Single, ready to mingle. Yeah. Gorgeous Josh. happy to bring dough balls <laughs> wherever he He's goes. got some hot dough that he'll come delivering <laughs> to your door, girls. Whatever you need. 
Right. Well yeah. done. See you later, Domino. It's like Captain. See you next week. It's like Captain Flashheart. Out of <laughs> <Black> <laughs> exactly. Woof, woof. Delicious. Uh, there goes our head of sales, who doubles up as a pizza delivery boy, uh, <laughs> yeah. multi-talented, and that's what we demand of our team. Um, we'll come on to our dough baller of the week, but let's clear up. I mean, just yeah. General Melcher driver should do. She's used to hang around with the big knobs. Woof. <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, yeah. I mean, going. Rugby does have an ability yeah, to have to a re- things. things looking... Re- I was going to say earlier, rugby at the moment, as a test team, is incredibly quick to bite you on the arse. You yeah. think you got it nailed, yeah. Scotland, and it comes and it nibbles. Yes. Rugby as a game at the moment, you're thinking, you know, Fran- Scotland-France, great game. England-Wales, absolute thriller. Ireland against Italy, well, you know, we know what's going to... Oh, my uh, God, what is happening here? What, turn, what, off, turn off 20 the TV. minutes, I've gone to do the ironing, yeah. which is not unusual, but it's like... <laughs> You know, it's a big Six Nations game. Yeah. And it's taken a gun to its foot. Yeah, I, it's a tough one because you, you know they're in for a tough day anyway with an on-form island and then to fully handicap handicap them by a law and that was made up because of things that people have done in the past. I would have focused more on the other side and making sure people can't do what they've done. So if you go off the... Why have they gone off? Are they actually injured? Check on that. Get an individual. You've got an individual or medical guy to check HIA. If someone goes off with an injury, you should. Why can't he also check that it's a genuine also, injury? The, the studio could have quite clearly gone off. Yeah, just to get a yeah shoulder. shoulder. Or, yeah, yeah. I, mean, like, I mean, it's not. It's not that they've done it on purpose. Yeah. But also, then, do we? I don't know. This is a question that I don't know because I've never been in the pack. Is do you should before the game when you declare your team. You should declare who is available to play in the front row and keep things contested if you have them. So it's already put out there. You know that the problem it, is there's a there's a load of legal requirements you've got to have gone in the front row to be able to yeah, know what you're doing. But there you would know that of your yeah. players that are on the bench. I don't think anyone because <laughs> yeah. they tried to they say to me once, "Ask goes up, can you go in the front row?" I was like, Absolutely not. Yeah. Uh, until I just got, when I got to about one thirty, and Eddie was like, "Actually, might be able to bring you back as a uh, as, as a prop." <laughs> as prop. I was like, "The amount of cash yeah. they're on, all you have to do is waddle around the field." <laughs> You know, well, lift. you'd say that, but our front row had yeah, 27 carries on yeah. the weekend, yeah. so it doesn't. But I, I think you, we, ha- it has to be looked at, and it, and it has to be looked at a way where you do declare who is a, who is a willing to play in the front row. So if you have another front row on the but bench, I don't think it willing. comes down to willing. I, I think no, if no, you start no. putting players in well, there no, who are but, willing but not trained, no, I mean, this is what no, Ben no, K was saying. No, 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 that's not what I'm saying. I'm okay. saying that they Rewind. are happy because it's been discussed pre-week and they have trained pre-week or they've played in the past. You can easily put that on the sheet that they can play the front row. So that covers the question mark of do you think you can or not. It's already written down and agreed to that if that happens, but I like the idea. I've always liked the idea of having more people on the bench with less substitutions that you can then you can adjust things for a tactical yeah. thing like that. Yeah, like bigger match day squads, but you still yeah. only have the same amount of subs. But you've got yeah. more options. I would say I still think we should go less subs, but you've got more options that if crazy scenarios happen, you can actually deal with them. Yeah. So I did my annual tweet, um, breaking news, it was a good eat. But the question I was asking, and oh, you're going to get nailed whatever you put out there, was Favia's tackle, which which the, which was the straight red card. Yeah. Is there a difference in this denish? Now, it's unacceptable to put shoulder on head regardless, but is there a difference between a malicious act, which is a straight red card, and a technical foul? Essentially, he set himself too high. Yeah. Is there a difference in your view around the ramifications or the punishment for those incidents? Yeah. Because th- I, what, th- what I want to go on to ask is, if he's got it wrong technically, which is what he has, does that mean that his team should play for 60 yeah, minutes with, with, with only 14 men? Or should he be sent men. off and a 20, which is the orange card, 20 minutes down to 14 men, but then you can bring on another player and you're, therefore the game has got a chance to get back to, to the contest that everybody wants it to be. Yeah, no, I, I agree there's something to be looked at here, an orange card or or whatever, because an individual, I mean, for that one, you can say he actually made a mistake. He didn't set himself low. I still I still think the ball carrier is dropping in height to, to brace for contact, but, you know, as a player, you know that's coming. You should be able to set yourself lower also. Um because he had enough time, there wasn't any obstruction or anything yeah. like which the referee did a very good job of actually explaining that. So well done yes. to him in terms of for everyone that was listening. But no, I agree. Something that, like that that's not done with malice. I don't like a red card for something that's not malice. Now, I understand we're trying to pro, uh, you know, head rules, but I, I would say on something like that, you punish the player and don't punish the team. So yeah. it's not done 
out on purpose. I don't like games finishing with 14 men because of something like that. So I'm like, you send the player off, but you can, and you take a punishment like a yellow card or like you said, 20 minutes, but then you can bring someone yeah. on and don't punish the team for something that's so technically, uh, the minutia is so small in terms of errors. You know, some of those red cards, Ferguson last year when someone yeah. popped his head up from a ruck when he was trying to clear it out and he's happened to hit someone on the head. Something you, you can't, the average Joe who's never played at international rugby doesn't understand the speed of that decision-making process. Yes. And sometimes without, you'd be the best player in the world, you still can't get that right. That the team doesn't get punished, just the player. And then he shouldn't get banned for a red card because it's an instant that, you know, that's something I think needs to be looked at. Red cards and banning is for properly things with malice, things with intent. Yeah. Not split second decisions that can, can, be, can be wrong. So that was the point you made there, which I thought was really interesting, is if you haven't played international rugby, you've got no understanding of the speed and the size and the, the decision-making process. I mean, they talk about a batsman having 0.2 seconds to, to work out what shot to play. I mean, if you've got 30, 15, 16, 17 stone guys running in all different directions, of course you can put out a tweet that says, everyone knows you shouldn't hit the head and therefore it's a red card. But I'd, yeah, I mean, you've raised your eyebrows at it. Can, can you just give a sense of actually how difficult it is to make those decisions in real time. It's very, very hard to do that. And uh, unfortunately, um, there are so many dynamics in terms of someone dropping their head, your height, you know, even, even going so low now, you know, often you can get done without using your arms yeah. because you can't wrap if you hit so. You know, you're talking about such nuances of, uh, at speed and, um, uh, and execution that, that Mike's exactly right. I just think it's something that's ruining the game because we're doing it for the right reasons to make the game more safe. I would say that what irritates me is the things that would actually make a difference to the game we're still not doing. Regards regards the you know the concussion protocol, lack of um, lack of contact training, and training, training and all that kind of changing all that stuff, which is actually what would make a difference. But they hundred percent need to, to to look into that rule and change it because it's it's pointless. I think Mike's right. You're not you're not helping the game by making it more complicated to un, you know to execute things you should actually go look if someone's made a genuine error that's fine bring on another bring on another have an ability to bring on another player and then don't punish them if it's a clear mistake because everyone makes everybody makes mistakes it's, you know i wouldn't know now how to clear out someone because obviously if someone goes over the ball i definitely don't right. yeah but if someone, if someone goes, know, i look forward to it, yeah. I, I look forward to anyone at bannock burn if i put my boots on just but watch if, out my clear but if someone's going for the going for the ball you know you're, you're asked to use force against force um but it's also force against force but with a completely unpredictable uh, picture yes, that is changing in front of you at the, the laws yeah. of physics and and we encourage kids to avoid contacts so you're stepping at the same time yeah. you've got you know you've got all these different um sort of things that can can affect the execution of what you're doing but because of that it's now defining defining games i just don't think it's right and people say well, yeah. everybody knows the yeah. rules but it's not that, simple that is the thing so with, with a tackle just not to own too nauseous you are always taught you've got to get nauseous your, nauseous the, the superlative of nause. Nause, yeah. yeah um you you've got to get your feet as close to the uh, the attacker as possible because you need to be as as tight as you can if you're going to make a dominant hit now everyone wants you to tackle lower but that means you have to drop earlier. That means the people with the athletes that we have in the game now, footwork, they can get a, an extra yard away from you, which means then you have to lunge, then you can get knee in the head and you can get knocked out. Not often there is an attacker who gets knocked out by a hit because we've got rid of the clothesline. We've got rid of short, like the proper sort of no arms mm. shoulder charge. The Trevelyo special. Yeah, we've got we've sort of got rid of those things and people are know that they need to try and hit below the ball. That's not. You say all those stuff, that, and you make it sound easy. Just get lower. It doesn't work no. like that because you don't want to get sta stepped. You don't want someone to get an extension that then handoff becomes very easy. There are so many things. I think you are making so multiple decisions. You're wondering: Is he going to pass it inside? Is he going to give it outside? There's someone out the back. I've got to stay alert that if he drops it out the back, I'm going to have to shift off. So, and then at the last minute, you've got to drop as low as you can and and put force behind it, or you're going to get run over with a big man on a big man. And it's not that easy to do. And I'm my biggest thing is if it's not malicious and if it's not uh, an intent to harm, then fine, the player should get punished. But I don't yeah. necessarily believe the team should. Yeah, should I think agree. you've put that really well. And I think you've explained the nuance of it, which is I, I, everybody would agree that head 
injuries have got to be prevented and you've got to do all you possibly can. Mm, yeah. But there is a reality to asking 30 guys to go hammer and tong for 80 minutes, but it's, factoring in exhaustion, factoring in a, a completely changing picture in front of defensive lines at all possible moments, that there has to be an understanding that players are going to get it wrong, but that shouldn't influence the outcome of the game. I mean, the game was ruined after 18 minutes, or 19 minutes or whatever it was, as a spectacle, as an event, as an occasion, 50,000 people in the stadium you're just waiting for the full time whistle. Can't, I think I don't think rugby can afford to have moments ruined. I don't think yeah. the, the the plethora of kind of <laughs> uh, of riches and finances to to have games like that ruined at the international level and to make up some spurious rules that are so, that are so complicated. You know, I mean, I mean, I when we got interviewed for the got interviewed by the Mirror to after we did the um, the Globe or before the Globe thing, and they was talking about, oh, I, you know, do you feel like you left rugby at the right time? You're one you're of your last games for. Was or whatever. When I left, I said, "Oh, you know, rugby's gone soft." Because I I went to hit someone, and as I swung, as I as I I hit him, my arm rode off his shoulder, got him. Didn't hit him in the face, but just got him above head, uh, above um, shoulder height. Pulled him down. The ball popped out, and we we scored. And they brought it all the way back to that moment, saying it was it was like a high tackle or dangerous, and it it, it well, started like, low. It's, it's like the seatbelt tackle. Yeah, yeah. It's seatbelt the, tackle it was called a seatbelt tackle because it can't get much safer than that. Yeah. yeah. And now it's allowed because one arm's over the neck. It's a complete nonsense of what it is. Because when you're on an outside break, as a as a if I'm a 13 and I'm defending, when people are running out, they lean and put their feet away from you. Oh, sorry, I'd lean away from the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing it as well. They they lean their upper body into you and move their legs away. So you can't really side them down. So it's the only way you can tackle is you put one over there and they fall over and you fall on top of them and it's actually a good tackle because you you get but you can bounce. I used to it was a tackle of my choice a lot of the time because you can use them to bounce off the floor back to your feet and then you're on the ball. Yeah. And now they've got rid of that. It makes it really hard for a 13 to then he has to lunge underneath the shoulder and the handoff probably and you it's it's so hard to do because even, then if you as I said you need to get close you've got your shot his shoulder in there where are you supposed to tackle? Yeah. It's yeah. interesting around the breakdown when they took away, you know, the, the croc roll or being able to roll someone. That was the easiest way to get someone yeah. out of the, out the breakdown. Now yeah. I have to hit the guy at such a, such hard, a hard speed, speed. And, and I have to pick a window between his head, his neck, under yeah. his arm. All and of which is bent over. And all of which is bent you, over. Yeah. And, and, and people go, oh, you know, you, every now and then you'd get someone to do a knee, unfortunately, with a yeah, croc. Yeah. But Jack, actually, Jack Willis, yeah. Jack Willis, but. But that's only because you could do the splits. Yeah. Yeah. That was, yeah. And that was because you got in such a diff- low position and didn't move. Most people, uh, when, especially when you teach you jiu jitsu or anything else, where your, he- where your neck goes, your body follows, you yeah. can't resist it. So you just used to come in low, roll someone straight off like a McCall, roll him off, the ball will be exposed. You get there. Now, it's, you've literally yeah. made the game more aggressive because I have to shift you using yeah. using more... the pilot and because everyone gets so long they'll yeah. pile into the back of your neck yeah and, yeah. and so it's, it's I just think just I, have doing... a fi- I have a fix for that too do you yeah everyone's got to step over if they want to steer the ball got to step over the man who's on the floor if you want to go for the ball that's what we you... used to do when we were eight yeah yeah but then you create three sort of zones where you can actually clear underneath people's shoulders because no one holds their feet now, no, right? No. Anyone who anyone who says they're holding Bounce their weight, it's a complete lie. No. Now, and, and re- referees would be my biggest thing that you should focus on. If their feet is behind their hips, they can't, they're, unless they're, they're, they are at the circus most of their life or they were circus folk <laughs> growing up, they can't balance without their, when their hips are in front of their toes. And so many people d- are still doing it. I feel if you could just step over the guy who's on the floor, then you create a, a clearing out window here, yeah. a clearing out window here, and a reasonable height that allows it. You're tapping it. under your arms for our audience. Yeah. yeah. And, and you create windows that are, are make it far safer yeah. where you shouldn't get, be getting head collisions. I would generally be terrified to play now. They're not uh, because I would imagine you get into a Grand Slam decider game and you're like fired up, you're physical, that's part of your game. And one miscalculation, and that's you over ruin the whole game. Yeah, uh, you know I, they they have to change it. And again, I, I always wonder about who makes these rules because they never they never discuss with any player group I've ever heard of. They sort of just appear. They they do have they, they do they, have proper very sort of old. Player. They do have old players on Form almost. Yeah. <laughs> Great, right, <laughs> excellent. Well I, well, I don't know. I'm I'm sure there is more than just a sort of. I would be surprised to say there is because I don't think. I've never. No one's ever been we, consulted. We, we are. We are a sport of old committees. Yeah. So. 
old committees sure and chaps we'll be, that you know, sure we'll play and defence was optional. Um, we are available. Uh, my my favourite thing is the ones that used to be the most violent are all in charge of the sighting <laughs> yeah, commissions Wade now. Dooley. Yeah. Wade Dooley. <laughs> that, is, that is archetypal poacher turned gamekeeper. Yeah. Uh, was it, it was not probing. Um, uh, Paul Rendell. No, no, the sorry. It, no, it was, it was probing. Pro, yeah, pro, so probing. Pro, pro, I gave probing a hug the other day at an event and, we, and, and I came a little wrestling. I think he thought I was going to fight. Tried to throw me down the stairs. <laughs> and I was honestly like, wow, still yeah. got that aggressive streak. <laughs> <laughs> um, there isn't a lot to talk about after Dublin, but I just quick a nod to Michele Lamoureux, the Italian captain, young yeah. guy. A very mean, difficult situation. Very difficult situation, didn't, but didn't, they've got a proper, do proper know, leader. Do you, know, do you know what I liked about it? And you talk about leadership is where there was a prop sort of got really angry about it in the background. Yes, and yes. He, and he, he sort of paused hey. the referee and he turned around and he went, hey, back off. Yeah. And, li and literally the guy was wandered off and that you know he was there and he was very calm and he accepted it i mean he could have really let that get to his head a little bit and he yeah he was getting good advice by the looks of things from the sideline as well because yeah. he was in like a three-way with obviously someone on the management team who's saying yeah we have yeah. to go down to 13 um but yeah i mean to finish the game with only 12 i mean i mean and if i was like thought i was playing league <laughs> <laughs> Actually, um, I did. Say, did you not say in that interview with Andy Fell there was a bit of Irish coming into him? Was there? And it was like Farrell. Northern. <laughs> it was like Northern crossed with a sort of Dublin massive. It was. Uh, oh, it was he's, interesting. he's got Irish family. I think he's very. It's he's his home. He's got family connections. You're paying your mega Dublin. cash. It's funny how yeah. you pick up the local <laughs> dialect. It's, it's it's the, the old Harry Enfield sketch. <laughs> with, uh, yeah. Giordio, Giordio, <laughs> whatever it was, the Spanish manager. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, back of the game like there isn't a huge amount to talk about as you said from Dublin, <coughs> but we are going to do our dough ball of the week who is going to go to uh, Matt Lowry Matt Lowry Matt Lowry I love uh, it when cult figures come in there'll be so many people who don't understand Matt Lowry really? Bad boys Bad no boys. I know yeah I mean, a dough ball he gets, he gets... Yeah, well, we're not going to send him a dough ball you're welcome to have a dough ball but we're going to give Matt Lowry uh, our dough ball of the week uh, which is our prize for sort of stand up why are we giving it to Mike? Uh, well obviously two tries on his debut um, he'd been talked about a lot as as um how good he should have had more chances, um, and then he he could have scored a hat trick. Could and have had did, a hat trick, and he just unselfishly gave it, gave it to his winger to score easy, and I I like that. And I did put a picture of uh, Mike Lowry, Mike Lowry. Mike Lowry from Bad Boys, <laughs> putting on his suit ready to go out, and I was like, "This is Mike Lowry." when he walks into Christelle's in Dublin tonight and then he actually liked it and he messaged me going, this is class. Good. Because of Maglaury's generosity in not accepting that <laughs> I don't, I don't send... think you could ever oh, do that. Do you not think? <laughs> I'm just quoting film scripts. Uh, we're going to say Maglaury. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Our Domino's Doughballer of the Week prize, which is a 50 quid voucher. So tuck into that, Mike. Um, mm. And well played to you, sir, on your uh, Six Nations debut. Uh, thank you to Domino's as well. We've pulled out all the stops and made the doughballs that we have in front of us especially for the good, the bad and the rugby. They're not widely available, apparently. Only the very best. The There's US. some great content coming from them um, as well. Soon. And a reminder as well that Domino's are offering 50% are offering off pizza when you spend £30 or more online. Thank you to the team at Domino's. Uh, well done for holding off on the pizza. You may now eat for two minutes and we'll put elevated <laughs> music over the top. <laughs> Mike Lowry. Well done. Finished chewing. I hope, viewers and listeners, that we've done that more acceptably than we have in the last few weeks, but sometimes needs must. Are you all right? What are you doing? I'm still chewing. Well, hurry up. Um, I oh, think your chewing's better than your heavy breathing, actually. <laughs> I'd rather tune into that. Well, if you combine them both. I know, that's, yeah. But don't open my mouth. Right? <laughs> Pass out. <laughs> it's an assault on the senses. Right, Tins is finishing off his, um, his dough balls. Inga Twigamala. Mm. Um, and actually, very sadly, uh, Joely Vendiri, who super rugby fans will remember as a great of the Auckland Blues when they were in their heyday. And we often talk about how good super rugby was back in 96, 97. Um, he very sadly passed away on the same day. So very sad times in New Zealand. But Inga the winger, I mean, it's unbelievably glowing tributes, not just about the player, but about the man as well. Did you did you play against? Are you, are you free to talk or not? I am. You are, <laughs> I'm back. Back in the game. Did you play against Inga in your early years? I think I did, yeah. Um, in the Newcastle days. I mean, he was just an unbelievable bloke. You just, you know, and not just the player, obviously a man mountain, literally like a prop on the wing. Um, but just as a human being, you know, I, I was reading Harvey Thornycroft's wrote a little thing to him on... Uh, on uh, LinkedIn and 
about his first time he played it and he was playing the game of his life against um, Epi. Uh, Tyone. Yeah, and they moved Epi to, to the other wing and they, he was like, well, whoever they bring on, I've, I've, I've seen. I've dealt with a tongue and lord, yeah. 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 <laughs> I can take it on. And, and then he, so <laughs> Inga came on who tried to run, drop the shoulder on him and he absolutely buried him. <laughs> and he picked him up. And he, but first person to pick him up went, mate, don't try and do that again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> with a smile <laughs> I think he said don't try to do that again old man and then and then was first person to shake his hand after and that was you know you you just only have to talk to Jason Robinson about him and he puts you know his whole change in his life to, down to Inga the winger and uh, yeah he was just a great human being and it's a sad, very very sad to see him die so yeah he, he made a bit of wasps when you were fanboy yes do you do you remember watching him play and just yeah I do and then obviously one of the original box office superstars of, he was of the he was of the he was the original Jonah before Jonah was the, the, the man do yeah. you know what I mean he was the guy that like straight trucked it footwork had that power you know kind of everything that you now feel is synonymous with big wingers he was the original G to, to ever do that um, and as I said you, you know earlier in the show you watch the highlights of just the intensity and passion he ran at a lot of, <laughs> all the videos I saw like <laughs> <laughs> little white boys running around and you just got him as an iron just smoking over the, pit, up the top of people um, running aggressively I yeah, think is yeah. how you best describe yeah. it just with that absolute pure passion and hatred but also what a, a real gentleman I think it's very sad as well to die so to die so young um, yeah. but to leave an incredible mark you know many n- not many people will leave the legacy that he that he has left um, and as I said he was the original original guy and won a hero all round being other winger um, gone but certainly never forgotten and Joe Vendiri as well two superstars of years gone by um, I suppose on to happy things I quickly wanted to mention Richmond Minis and I know you want to talk about Minch Minis can you give us a little brief because you had two unbelievably exciting games in the sunshine yeah it was uh, it was Jue Jue on the down Minch on Sunday morning right. um, it's always hard to get Mia to go but then she's like I don't it's like exactly it exactly the same with Harry I don't like it and then she get there and yeah. she's off um, yeah uh, Mia scored a couple but uh, yeah we had first game we were playing against Painswick um, so actually uh, George um uh, Coach George was there, Skimmington, um, with his boys. Gorgeous George was there. He was there with his uh, his uh, boy lad was playing for Paisley against Mia. So um, yeah, and it was an eight all thriller in the first game, and yeah. then a nine all thriller in the second. Oh, yeah. I could say four, 40 forty if you want to put five yeah. points on each try, but. That is box office. It was. It was. And box by office. the end, I Mia tell you, was... tag tag rugby is impossible. If you've got slinky hips, yeah. whit, whit, there's <laughs> this kid, you, you know you talked about. Oh, I left an arm out there. There's this kids go. How have you not managed to grab these flags? And then you you sort of have a bit where yeah. Mia's on the bench and you say, right, I'll catch you. And she just moves. She can't get these flags. Really? It's impossible. Is, is Mia slinky hips and speedy? Um, She's obviously got them from her mother. <laughs> Saturday night Zara. Da, da, da. It's it's funny how much she's changed over the the last sort of this year is since they've been back in terms of getting figuring out how to avoid people because yeah. before they, they just all be really bunched. They, it, now they're getting more where they run across and they but then they're all stepping back and people are just falling around. But Mia's also yeah. pretty much a bit of a badass. She's kind of my like I, I kind of want if you know, baby potato when she arrives, I kind of wanted to end up like me because she's proper badass. When we went on a shooting date up there, one of her cousins pushed her over, one of her girl cousins, and she was on the floor like Mither and, and Tins and I were talking. And she was like, Dad, Dad. I was like, Mia, just get up and get her. Go and get her. And she, and she was like, Mither, and you went, Mia, just get up. And she ran over, tackled her there, having a full-on scrap, like, you know, not punch but a full on scrap I was like choke her out it was, it was it was amazing and they were like she was proper into it not like she's a bit of a girly girl Asuka just taught her how to do an arm bar so uh, <laughs> unfortunately Isla's recovered she's yeah. in hospital but right. no, she's a I'm proper... so worried for the baby onion at this point but, yeah. I mean, it's going to be off the top rope in no time but at I all but I kind of like that because the balance of like she'll play quite quietly and be quite girly when it wants to be but we'll give it give it out when required I think that's kind of the, the modern day woman isn't it yeah yes yes it is welcome to 2022 so uh, talk to us about Richmond well, it, we, is, are, we we had full, a... are we in contact full contact yeah so yeah. Harry's Harry's under 10s and it's absolutely full contact and I wanted to just say mainly a, a massive thanks to Neil and Michelle and Andy and all the coaches at Richmond they do a fantastic job we had a day at Rosslyn Park uh, in the sunshine god it makes a difference when the sun shines 100 kids running around Rosslyn Park proper outfit proper club uh, hot dogs afterwards and what was really interesting the bit I was going to mention is that, I mean, Harry is nearly 10 and sort of watches a bit of the international stuff, but they've got a 4G pitch at Roslyn Park. And so they had 100 kids running around going bananas, lots of tackling, everyone having a good time. And then all the, all the minis went off and had hot dogs. And five minutes later, the under-16s game started. 
and the impact of the uh, of, of watching the under 16s for the under nines and under 10s was enormous. So normally we're straight in the car and home and we spent another, we watched the whole game. And that was more for you, though. That it? was more for me. <laughs> yeah. Well, the re- and, and I say that because um, it was a proper game. So Roslyn Park took on Dorking, and I just wanted to give a shout out because Dorking proper side they were victorious. Congratulations to them. But um, Roslyn Park played really well, and they scored in the corner. I was sitting in the sunshine with a mate, um, just sort of waiting for the kids to stop mucking around. And as, they scored right in the corner. And as they as the kid walked back to kick the conversion, he was getting his kicking tee, and he said, "My God, are you Alex Payne?" <laughs> And I said, yeah, yeah, yes, yes, I am. And he goes, I love the pod. I've listened to all, I, I, I listened to the Dan Carter one just the other day. And I said, good on you. I said, if you get this, I'll mention you on the pod. Yeah, so he put his tea down and I was standing right behind him. So I was kind of putting the pressure on and he missed. So I can't mention him. But then they scored again in exactly the same corner. As he walked back, I sort of saw his eyes flicker and he looked and I said, double or quits, you get it and I'll mention it. And he missed it again. <laughs> so, so I'm really sorry, so, kiddo. You don't get the mention, in the but the story goes in. You're and in um, it was just really good to see. I mean, proper, proper athletes at under 16 level. He needs to send that video in when he doesn't get one from the touchline. Yeah, yeah. And then he'll send us in a worldie and we'll, we'll give you a shout out. But how well done much, to both those two teams. How much better, though, would uh, kids rugby be if it was a summer sport? Well, this is it. This and is how exactly much, what we were talking and about. And how many of them would stick at it? Because... There's nothing worse than when you start learning contact, you go to a pissing rain, yeah. through the pissing rain, in a on a, on a local grassroots field, which could be on a, a slight incline or a massive incline. Yeah. You ta- you go to tackle someone, you get a cold boot in the face, on a cold face, sliding in tears, deer shit. sliding in deer yeah. shit, fox shit, your knees are cut up, and you just go, I, this is awful, yeah. I don't want to go. Yeah. It almost put me off for life. My, I was just like that as a kid. I just didn't want to go down yeah. for, for years. Summer, yeah. absolutely but, but, but key. I, I could not, re-emphasize that more because in December, January, all, all at the end of the training session, we're running for the car yeah. because Harry's freezing. And yet yesterday in the sunshine at, in Roslyn Park, um, he was there for an hour and, and a half. The Hot dogs, drinks. The argumentative fans say, well, you know, what about, you know, grassroots fields and the quality of grounds, maintenance and being hard? Well, the kids in South Africa get on with it and they're all the toughest people I've ever met. So if little Bertie falls over and grazes his knee, it's better than falling in a pile of mud and you know what, it might toughen him up a bit or little Sarah falls over. These are non-existent kids, but you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I don't see that as, as a problem. Yeah, yeah, I know they talk about concussion, but it's like, look, you know, you get knocked out hitting a field, uh, hitting a, a muddy field. I think it would be much better and I think it would change the attendance, it would change the excitement, you know, and also ro- lots more grassroots clubs would make w- way more money because people would be hanging around for barbecues, for food, community spirit, people would come down. Now, it's awful. I see little kids with their little shorts on, tiny shorts, little leggings, gloves, baggy tops, and you're like, <laughs> oh, I feel so. I don't want to get out of the car, and I'm a full grown adult, let alone being forced <laughs> down to my local rugby club. Yeah, that's great fun. Um, it's been a really good weekend. It has. I've, I feel very good about the sport at the moment. We, we occasionally, you know, get a bit down, and it's a bit like a mechanic. You fix cars all day. You don't necessarily want to go home and talk about cars, but I think at, at the moment, rugby's in a. It's nice to have a hot wing weekend. Do you, right? want, do you want to talk about Spain beating Romania? Go Could on, then. Be, well, give us an update. Well, so Spain beat. Romania on the weekend. Obviously, they got the the draw against Georgia not so long ago. They could actually, you know, to put to, to bring back the debate of what Italy do and do we have a qualification match. So Spain could actually win that group and get the automatic spot in the Rugby World Cup. Why don't we get rid of um, Scotland and Wales from the Six Nations? Away trip to Rome, so- Madrid, oh. Cape Town, <laughs> London, obviously, Paris. Milan, I mean, uh, uh, Dublin. I'm sold. I mean, I'm, pr- I'm pretty certain that they'd be amazing. Yeah, the corporate gigs, Co- the see. corporate gigs, the sunshine, and the travel trips. The smutbies that look after us in, oh. in Cape Town. We'd have the time I mean, of our lives. I, th- I actually think we should do that just for ourselves. No right. offense, though, let's build but... our, let's build our own tournament. And also, you know, like Cardiff on a night out's great, and the stadium's great. Okay, maybe let's just get rid of Scotland because I'll be honest <laughs> with you, it's always raining. The default We're setting going... up is. On Friday. Okay, yeah. okay. Can we get rid of Scotland uh, after, after this weekend? Yes, yeah. we can. But I'm, 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 I'm genuine. Uh, what, an away game to Madrid? Oh, that'd be um, next level. Yes, please. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yes um, please. We've done lots of grumbling about rugby's inability to embrace social media. Have you seen the LA Guiltini's kit launch just as a finale finale? I did see and it was fantastic. Celine Dion. Tom Bobby um, Mitchell. I mean, we talk about Roman Untermach having the greatest hair in the game. I think at the um, moment. Yeah. But he's he's got Tom, that sort of it's cave, like a cave man mani match. What was what were the people that had the tigers? 
um, you know, in Vegas, who had always oh, had right. Siegfried and Roy. Siegfried, Siegfried and Roy. Roy. He's got. A, I mean, he's he's Siegfried plus and Roy at the moment. If you haven't seen it, it's well worth having a look. L- L.A. Guillotini's uh, kit. But there is some great Celine Dion on TikTok. There is some great social media. Like I think Bristol do very good social they media. Do. But I think the Barbars reason, do very good. Barbers do. The reason the reason they like it is because it's so out the yeah. ordinary in comparison to all the other vanilla stuff. And actually, yeah. some of the other social media companies, because I've seen the videos or clubs, we're going to do some really creative videos. And when it comes to posting, they all shit themselves and then don't do it. It's weird. That, like, there, there, there was an amazing one between, I think, Tigers and Bristol a couple of years ago where they did a full skit of the Anchorman car park fight. Right. Where, you know, got in and like when Brick, Brick kills a man with a trident. Like, yeah. And they, they go through the whole routine. They were going to put it out there and and one, I think it was the Tiger guys, whatever, just bottled it and just wouldn't let them put, wouldn't let them post it. And the video content was amazing. It had guys lip syncing to the full words, all dressed up in costumes, false moustaches, you know, never, no, <laughs> don't touch the hair or face. And um, they bought, so there is the ability to do it, but we're still just governed because what happens if we put a funny social video out and we lose? <laughs> Everyone's going to get upset or we'll just get on with life and, and at least we've got a funny video to watch when we're depressed at home. Love it. Um, any more before we wrap up? No. Any final thoughts? No, I thought the the the, um, the players' lounge was great. I thought it was it a bit was. dry to start with. That bloke with the custard cords, he really kicked the kicked things on. I thought discovering that Pat Sanderson um, had mowed his foot off with a, with a fly yeah, mow that was extraordinary. That was extraordinary. That it, it, I let him tell the full story of that. And it's great to see Shane Williams. Yeah, got to say again, he was at, very much at the mould of um, Ryan Jones' club. Of I saw him and I was like, oh god, I'm so sorry. How long? Have you got? And he went, no, I've just taken up Iron Men. I was like, oh, because you know they've got that real glassy, yeah. super lean, super lean look. Hollow he, eyes. Yeah. And he said, even he admitted it, he went, it's awful. He goes, I thought, I, you know, I wanted to run a marathon. I thought it was quite good with the adulation, but actually these Iron Men, they're not fun. You're on your own. It's terrible, but the sports and mentality, they're all addicted to doing it. Yeah. A good weekend. Um, a couple of bits before we finish. And um, we try and be a broad church and we try and help um, good causes wherever we can. So I just want to give two quick shout outs. First of all, to Andy Vorton, who is a dad of three and has recently been diagnosed with motor neuron disease. And I hope you're hanging in there, Andy. It's a tough old battle to fight. But it is great to hear that you're going full bore at the fundraising for MND Association and the My Name's Doddy Foundation. Andy and his team, the Sandbaggers, are looking to set the record for the longest game of beach touch rugby. They've got to go for 33 hours and 33 minutes. Guinness Book of Records are going to be uh, there over the course of the event. It's taking place on the 20th and 21st of May on Branscombe Dean Beach in Poole in Dorset. And they are looking for supporters for the event itself. Get down there if you're in the area. And sponsors as well. So if Motor Neurone Disease Association or the My Name's Doddy Foundation are two causes that touch your heart and you'd like to get involved, please do so. Do so. They are good people to support and you can find out more details by Googling the sandbaggers. So good luck to Andy. Um, and we did also just want to take a note and a moment to talk about a 17-year-old rugby player called Niall Stringer, who has very sadly taken his own life recently. It goes without saying that our thoughts are with his family, friends and teammates at Rochford 100 and Old Brentwoods in Essex, and they have set up a fundraising page as well. So you can donate if you'd like to, to help with cover- covering funeral costs to the family's Just Giving page, which is well up to over 13 grand. So thank you to everyone that's been involved with that already. If you're local to the area, Old Brentwoods RFC are also putting on a memorial game on the 1st of May. The rugby community, when it does come together, is a wonderful thing. And I hope that, Niall, you are fondly remembered and there is a toast to you on the 1st of May. Can I just add one thing to that? For those of you who listened to our podcast, who are predominantly men, if you're feeling, if you're having issues, you're feeling down, you're having bad days, which we all have, got problems going on, please uh, speak up about it. Please reach out to someone, friends, family, a therapist. There are so many facilities out there. You know, taking your your own life should never be an option. And uh, we're always very vocal on this podcast about that. And a lot of um, the people from the, from Niles Club contacted me, wanted me to repost stuff. And do you know what? The most important thing we can do instead of reposting stuff is it doesn't have the effect is to talk about it on here and actually make a massive, a massive difference. And, and, you know, as I said, everybody has bad days. Everybody's got something going on, even if they look like the most happy person in the world. Call your mates up, check in. If you don't hear from them, don't take no for an answer. Don't take fine for an answer. Find out what's going on. But also... You have to match talk with action. You can't just sit there and go and speak to someone. You need to make sure you change things and help people because we can't have that happen. And if we can save one life on this show and someone reaching out, that's the most important thing. Yeah. And there are charities out there. There's Loose Heads and Brave Minds. So, yeah, just to echo um, uh, Hask's words, don't don't sit there in silence. 
you could go out, out share a beer with your mate. They'll, he'll probably want, he'd want to be part of it. So just let him in. 100%. I'll throw it out there as well. I talk to someone every week. It's the best hour of the week. You're welcome. You've got, you've got us too. I, mean, I speak to you every day. working with you two. It means I have to go talk to someone else every week. It is worth doing. Please look after each other. Um, and please don't suffer in silence. So we'll leave that as a, a thought. Um, a couple of other just quick bits before we go. Predict about we've mentioned already. Two out of three this week. Do have a look at how he's faring uh, on our socials. Um, and thank you to City Index for making Bert the Predictor a thing. Uh, City Index, of course, are partners here at The Good, The Bad and The Rugby and the leading provider of spread betting, CFD and FX trading. We do need a three out of three. I hope that'll come in round four, Bert. Good luck with that. Um, there is a new episode of The Good, The Scars and The Rugby Out. Last week, we had Scars and Elmer talking to Rachel Taylor on it. So don't miss that one. A really interesting chat with the ex-Wales coach and international. It's been really nice having a positivity session. It has. Uh, just two little bits. I thought Elmer was brilliant. She actually spoke right. sense and when she came into the live show she last week. She took everything that you said and articulated it in a really yeah. sort of concise Yeah, really professional. Chloe was, was like, she's brilliant. She should be on the show more regularly. It was, it was quite funny. On the back of that, someone accused uh, someone obviously she was about what uh, South Africa want to do coming into the Six Nations and everything else and someone then had a go at Emily Scarrett because she was like Emily shouldn't be saying you know that stuff she needs to learn more into it uh, poor Emily it's about, actually it's about time she, Emily had some against who's got, her who's currently got a statue, yes, statue. in central London that was my second point yeah she, well for, for a woman who's had an amazing career but absolutely hates the fact she has a podcast yeah. named after uh -huh. her, the good, the scars and the rugby. I obviously want this to be the James Haskell show with friends, but that was vetoed. Um, she's why. now got a, a statue of herself uh, in, I think, a display somewhere in London, I think near London Bridge or one yeah. of the bridges in pink. She looks fantastic. So for someone who shuns the, the spotlight, she's got a show and a statue What's I, next? I the building? She, I think she's like you, though. She just shuns it until <laughs> cash is thrown in front of her, yeah. her accolades. And then she, oh, yeah, no, I can do that. Yeah, I, Well, if you could just fight <laughs> yeah, yeah. I have three statues. Um, Scar's back in action on the bench uh, for Loughborough as well. So very nice to see her back. And very nice to have producer Shira back this week as well, who's off the bench and back into production action. We have been the good, the bad and the rugby. We will see you next week. As we said, the show is pulled together by Shira. Lovely to have you back. And the world-class fixer that is Matt Chuck Norris, the good, the bad and the rugby is a folding pocket production. Look after each other. Have a very good week. <laughs>